want us to pray as we dive into God's Word together. Well, Holy Spirit, we are here because of you. You are amazing, God. There is no one like you. There's nothing like you. You are God. Lord, right at this very moment, we are quiet in your presence. We are stilled before you, and we all at this very moment, humble ourselves before you, that you would get through to us, Lord. Lord, help us to quiet down what is happening around us and help us to yield and sense what you are saying to us and the very leading of the Holy Spirit who lives within us to him. Lord, have your, have your way with us. God, we ask, as a church, we ask that you would enable us by the power of your grace that we would become the very church that you are desiring for us to be. Lord, the very intent of your heart for Christ's fellowship church, that we would become that. And God, we are asking that you would make us a healthy, vibrant church full of the Holy Spirit. That we would be enabled by the power of your grace to be of influence here in South Georgia, here in Valdosta. God, we ask that you'd make us as a church fruitful and we think, of your promise to, to us individually, but also to your church. And the promise is of abiding fruit. John chapter 15, that as you abide in us and we abide in you, it is to the Father's very glory that we bear fruit that reveals you and your glory. Lord, we pray that you would grow us healthy in the unity of the Holy Spirit, that you would grow us healthy, that we would be the very ones who are forgiving others, forgiving one another, and forgiving others out there. And that, Lord, we as a church will excel in loving you and in loving each other. And that, Lord, that we will hold to the truth of your word, that we as a church will hold to the gospel. Lord, we are asking that you'd make Christ Fellowship Church a mountain-moving church by faith, God. And this would so bring glory to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people say amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and turn together to 1 Thessalonians. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. As we do continue in 1 Thessalonians, as we have noted before, the title of our series is Healthy, Vibrant Church. And we are, without doubt, aspiring to be, and in fact, it is our prayer as we just prayed that we here together by God's grace that we would indeed actually be His healthy vibrant church. We, as his very people, born of the Spirit, believers in Jesus, that's us, that we would indeed be his mountain movers of faith and in faith. I'll put it like this, that our faith in him would grow big and go big. Each and every one of us here today needs to be mindful of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, which unequivocally states that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And what about Romans 14, 23, that so powerfully reminds us that everything that does not come from faith is sin? What? 
Yes. That's what it says. It is true. The answer is obvious to the question of what actually characterizes the believer in Jesus Christ. You know what it is? Belief. He or she believes in Jesus Christ. And in fact, that's what characterizes you and me and us together. We believe in him. We live by faith in him. I'll put it like this. We are alive by faith in Christ. As God, by his sovereign grace, has so personally and so wonderfully imputed the very righteousness of Christ Jesus, his son, to you and me through faith. That is Romans chapter 1, verse 17. The righteous will live by faith. A.W. Tozer said, faith is the gaze of a soul upon a saving God. Blaise Pascal said, faith is a sounder guide than reason. Reason can only go so far, but faith has no limits. Charles Spurgeon said, if we cannot believe God when circumstances seem to be against us, we do not believe him at all. He's right. And in fact, that very quote by Spurgeon takes us right into our study of the Thessalonian church. Why? Because they were so trusting God in circumstances that were so against them. As we had noted last week from verse 6, as well as Acts chapter 17, the Thessalonians' great suffering was how unbelieving, jealous Jews, along with idol-worshiping Gentiles, how it is that they rose up like a mob in revolt against the gospel and against Paul, Silas, and Timothy. In fact, we noted they, they ran them out of town. And then the Thessalonian believers were left there to stand in faith in Christ while the entire city Think of that. The whole city was opposed to them, hostile against them. It was quite dark, cold, hostile atmosphere. This last Thursday, I went out to play pickleball with Chris Russell. And I think we probably had three hits, and then we had to quit. Because I looked up, this is the afternoon, you remember what happened on Thursday, I looked up, we're seeing these black clouds moving in, and man, they are rolling in, and they're rolling in fast. In fact, we're like, let's get out of here now! We rolled out of there, and it was amazing just how fast the whole atmosphere changed. That is the spiritual picture of the atmosphere spiritually over the Thessalonian believers at that time. Man, it was dark, and it was coming in, and it was hostile. And the beauty of them, the, the, the glory of the Lord in them, is that in this very situation, the Lord was enabling them in the power of his grace to stand by faith in him in the whole process. And what's cool is, is God is now encouraging them for the way that they have been standing in faith. And this is what's happening in verses 7 and 8. Let's look together. It says, this is Paul. He says, as a result, you have become an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only did the message of the Lord ring out from you to Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone out to every place so that we have no need to say anything more. In other words, who you are in your life in the Lord and the way you have believed him has said it all. We can't add to it. Your faith in the Lord and what he's doing in your lives speaks volumes. See, that is how big their stand in faith actually was. 
Macedonia and Achaia in the first century comprised an area of roughly three to 400 miles. And today, this same area includes modern-day Greece with parts of Albania, North Macedonia, and Bulgaria. Right now, that same region that Paul is speaking of right here. You say, well, Jim, why does that matter? Because do you realize how massive the scope of influence was? How big the scope of influence was for this small church in Thessalonica. We, we got to keep in mind, this is, this is the first century, so there's, there's no cell phones, there's no email, there's no cars, there's no buses, there's no TV, there's no electricity, yet word was getting out like wildfire to all the surrounding believers. Do you understand how encouraging this was to believers at the time? Neighboring churches, churches hundreds of miles away are hearing about these Thessalonian believers and how big they are trusting God and the situation in which they're trusting God. Hey, did you guys hear about the, the, the church and Thessalonica, did you, did you hear? Did you hear, hear what's going on? I mean, these, they are truly living the gospel. They're, they're living by faith in Christ right now. Their lives, without the shadow of a doubt, their lives have been radically transformed by God's incredible grace to the effect that they're standing in the face of such incredible hostility. Yet they continue to stand by faith in Christ. Even in the opposition from those that hate God and hate them. Now, Thessalonian believers were not caving in to them. The Thessalonian believers were indeed not backing down. They were not compromising by acquiescence to the standards and pressures of the, of the world around them. That's not them. No, they're standing in faith in the Lord. And we have a moment where we kind of put ourselves in the shoe, the sandal of a first century believer. And, and here you are, your life belongs to Jesus, and you, you have entered into struggles and difficulties in your own life. Why? Because of your definitive stand in Christ. And, and yet your family, you know, they, they worship idols. And you have all these people like that that, I, that you've had to kind of sever with. Why? Because of your stance in Christ. So things have been difficult, and you hear, you get the word of these Thessalonian believers and the way that they're trusting God, and something triggers in you. It's like this is water for a parched soul for you. You're encouraged, and you realize with your brothers and sisters in Christ that in your church, hey, if they're standing like that, if they're standing in the face of such hostility like that, we can too here in our church. Let's see what God will do with us. So we stand in him. And really, we do have to think about us here at Christ Fellowship Church. And I want to ask, how might God be desiring to use our faith in the Lord as an example for other believers in Jesus? Think about that. How might God be prompting you in your prayer, in your trusting in him as he's brought you and me together? How might God be moving us to a moment of faith where we're going big, we're trusting him big, we're moving mountains in faith? Hey, have you guys heard about that little church in South Georgia? It's called Christ's Fellowship Church. It meets in this little metal building. 
And they just began to cry out to God. They began to ask God for the more that he might have. They began to cry out to him, asking him for more of the breath of the Holy Spirit, more fresh wind and fire of the Holy Spirit. And they didn't let up. They just kept asking God. And then God brought it. And as God brought it, they were set free. And others came in and were set free. And they worshiped God. And it was amazing. And more and more people have come to Jesus Christ. And then they could say, wow, I wonder what God will do with us and our church. That, that's God's design here. And as we go big in faith, God plans to use us as an example, stand out for them, that others would go big in faith. And this applies not only for us as a church, but also to you in your individual life. How, how God is desiring to paint his picture in the way that you trust him as a family, in the way that you trust him in your job, in the way that you trust him as a couple. He's looking to write that story in faith. And I'm going to ask you, will you believe him? Will you trust him? Will you go big? Now what's happening here as we move to verse 9 is the Apostle Paul, he's writing from the city of Corinth, and he is hearing reports from those other believers in this whole huge region. He's hearing reports from these other believers as to how definitive the Thessalonians' commitment to God in faith actually is. Look at verse 9. Paul says, For they themselves report, for they themselves report what kind of welcome you gave us, speaking to the Thessalonians. In other words, we're hearing from other believers of your reception of us. You've got to understand that when Paul says this, he also includes their welcome of the message of the gospel itself. In fact, we saw that, I believe, in verse 6. That is, the good news that Christ has come and has gone to the cross for them, as well as for you and me today. It is the good news that Christ shed his divine holy blood, giving them the incredible eternal gift of forgiveness, as well as for you and me today. It is the incredible news that Jesus rose from the dead on day three, defeating death for them, as well as for you and me today. And they, just like us, have placed their faith, their trust, in the risen Christ, and they, having been born of the Spirit, as are we, are new creations in Christ, they now belong to God, as do you and I. We belong entirely to God. We are His. And an idol, an idol of any sort, an idol of any form no longer has any place in your heart, my heart. The same is so true with the Thessalonians in the first century as verse, verse 9 continues. Look at it says, it says, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So what's going on is Paul is catching wind. He's hearing with his own ears the, the verification of the fact that they are for real people of God. They're not mere talkers. They're not hypocrites. They're not posers. They're not sellouts to the world around them. They're not halfway Christians, if that even exists. They're not, they're not, not any of that. Why? Because they are all in with God in faith. In faith they have definitively left their old life of idolatry behind so that now they serve God, the living and true God. Now, I have to ask the question, in light of this verse, and thinking of you and me and us together, is it clear, I'll ask it of you, but I also include myself in this, is it clear 
to the people around you? Is it clear to them that you have left your old life behind to serve the living and true God? I've got to ask you, is it clear to them or is it in fact foggy? When they look at you and your lifestyle, are they, do, do they say of you that it's just like everybody else? Is it foggy? Or is it crystal clear? Because it needs to be, it has to be crystal clear. In other words, there is to be no, no guessing game as to who you and I serve in faith, the living and true God, and no other. No other. And this is important to note because some of us right here today might actually be blending in a little too well with the world. Maybe we're blending in too closely with current culture, pop culture. It could be that some of us here blend in so well, so well, that there is actually no distinction between us and the guy or girl who in actuality has rejected Jesus Christ. And who in actuality are living a lifestyle on schedule for the wrath of God. And there's no distinction between our life and theirs? Like, what? You find yourself in that predicament. I'm going to call out the truth. This is a big issue with God. Massive. Because you, as his believer, indwelt by his very Holy Spirit, and you, by faith, your life in faith in him is to stand out wholly different from the lifestyles of the world around us. It has to be. This is what he's calling you to. This is what he's calling me to. This is what he's calling this church family to. In our faith, we are to be distinctly his. In our faith in him, we're to be known as his, belonging to him. In fact, God says to all of us here today, you are to be holy because I am holy. That's 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Where are you with that today? In your faith in him. Will you, will you be like the Thessalonian believers where it was so clear as day who, who they belonged to? There was no mistaking that they belonged to the Lord. The people that hated them and hate the Lord knew. They had turned from idols to serve the living and true God. That is the definitive statement of them. The question is, will that be the definitive statement of you? Verse 10, and to await his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, our deliverer from the coming wrath. So the, these Thessalonian believers, as they in faith served the living and true God, they had an essential spiritual posturing in faith. You say, what is that? Is they are looking to the return of Jesus Christ, who happens to be their deliverer and our deliverer deliverer from the coming wrath. God's wrath is real. It's coming. Jesus saves us from it all. I got to point out that one of the, 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 the best gauges in terms of the spiritual temperature of you and me as believers, one of the best gauges of our spiritual lives is to think how we are thinking of the return of Jesus Christ. For instance, if you happen to be a believer today who is quite immersed 
in the values of the world, in the standards of the world, in the practices of the world, in the lifestyle of the world. If that is you, you likely do not want to be talking about the return of Jesus. You don't want to think about it. And the reason you don't want to think about it is because you know you're not living for him. So you properly can think about your own spiritual vitality at that moment. You've got to recognize, and I'll use this word, it is dangerous. This ice-cold spiritual temperature. Being in love with the world so much to the point where you're not thinking about the return of Jesus. You're immersed in the world. It's a dangerous place to be. But again, we go back to the gauge in terms of how you think and how you feel about the return of Jesus Christ because we can flip it over and we can realize today that if we, if we, if us, if we have decided that we're focusing in on Jesus and that we're making him the center because he is the center of the universe that he created and he is the center of our lives and we're recognizing that indeed he is going to return and you have this expectant, joyous hope. It's glorious because you, you know that when he comes, it's final vindication. It is final deliverance. Glory beyond anything that you can imagine. So that's where your brain is. That's where your heart is. That's what you wake up in the morning to think about as the return of Jesus. And you find yourself when you do this. It's just amazing. When you start thinking about the return of, of Jesus as a believer and dwelt by the Spirit, you find yourself wholly living for him. You find yourself making changes in your life in light of what is coming. You see, it's such an incredibly valuable spiritual gauge. When you're living for the return of Jesus, your spiritual vitality is white hot on fire for him. This is what he's called you to be. This is what he's called for this particular church. We're to be all in with God, expectant, looking to the return of Jesus Christ when everything will change. And it'll all be worthwhile because he sees what you're doing behind the scenes. He's seeing the very motive of your heart. He's seeing you. He's watching you live a life of love when nobody but him is watching. And you will be rewarded. Vindication will come in, with, and through Jesus Christ on that day. I was reminded of Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, and this is actually a, a great passage for us to end on. And then we're going to pray this. And this, listen to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. It says, Therefore, since you have been raised with Christ, that's, that's where we dwell, that's our, stat, that's our standing as believers. Therefore, since you've been raised with Christ, Strive for the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Father, we ask, God, that this would sink so deep into our spirits, into our minds, Lord. God, we pray for anyone here today, Lord, that might be described, as we we talked about, having that ice-cold, dangerous spiritual tenor. Lord, we pray for him and for her, God, that repentance will happen. God, that you'd stir inside their very spirit as they belong to you, that they would turn away from the sin. They would turn away from the lifestyle of of the world. And, And God, we pray for our young people. God, that they will catch this. Lord, that they would be on fire for you, God. And God, I pray that Colossians 3, 1 through 4, just as we ended, and we're seeing we're seeing the Thessalonians living for you. We want to do likewise here. 
We thank you, God, for the way that you're blessing us and helping us, Lord. We thank you for all the warnings you give to us. We thank you most for the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit and how you will never leave us, you'll never forsake us. God, make your word so real in our hearts. Help us to tuck it away. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.